15. Young people did a great uh, job during prayer time. And, uh, we appreciate that. Appreciate the uh, ladies that work with the, the young children. Appreciate you, what you do. Matthew chapter 15. In this portion of scripture, you would find that uh, the, the Jews, the people that uh, Jesus came to first, they had rejected him as Messiah. You know, where the Bible says that he came into his own, and his own received him not. And he is beginning to turn to the, the Gentiles. So we would be in that group, the, the Gentiles. We are not the, the, the Jews, we're the Gentiles. And the church has not replaced Israel. Uh, the Jews have been set aside until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And uh, we understand that. You can read in Romans chapter 11 and so forth that the Jews are uh, God's uh, chosen nation. And that he will uh, bring them back in. He will have his final dealing with the Jews after the, the rapture. The seven years of great tribulation. God's final dealing with the Jews. But uh, we are the, the Gentiles. And that if, if a person gets saved, they get saved the same way. Jew or Gentile. Anybody that gets saved, they get saved the same way. But in this portion of scripture, uh, the Lord Jesus has, uh, as the Bible says, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks, so to the Jew first, he made his first appearance uh, to them. They rejected him. In Matthew chapter 15, we'll pick up in reading verse 21 down through verse 28. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the good songs that have been sung and now the scripture that has been read. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with thy spirit and help me to preach the word of God. And dear Lord, I ask that you would help me not to preach anything that's heresy, but truth, and that it would be received as such, dear God. And dear Lord, that tonight Christ alone would get the glory and honor, but you would help us, your people. We stand in need. America stands in need. Dear Lord, we are a needy people, and we ask you to help us, dear God. Dear Lord, wherever the word of God goes forth this evening, we ask that somebody would get saved. And dear Lord, that a saint of God would be encouraged and strengthened, and that most of all, the Savior would be high and lifted up. We commit this service unto you, and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. In this particular account, this is a Gentile woman, the woman of Canaan. Another account would say Syrophoenician. She is a Gentile, she's not a Jew, that comes to the Lord Jesus with uh, this need. And she cries out unto him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And the disciples trying to send her away and asking the Lord to send her away. Some would argue the point that they're 
asking the Lord, just go ahead and give her what uh, she desires so that she would leave and others uh, would say that it is them professing that it is a burden and uh, to send her away. And so the Lord uh, deals with her and it's a matter of faith and she passes the faith test and her prayer her request is answered. In verse 28, the Lord Jesus comments on her faith saying, O woman, great is thy faith. There is another account of an individual, the centurion, that wanted his servant healed. And you know the account there. He was obviously a non-Jew as well, a Roman centurion. And he cared for his servant. And he bid them to go get Jesus, that the servant would be healed. And as he was seeing him, he said to Jesus that he was not worthy that Jesus would come and just speak the word. And the Bible speaks about the Lord Jesus commenting that he had great faith had not seen that kind of faith in Israel or amongst his own people. And so it's saying that the Jewish people who the Savior came to did not practice or offer up that kind of faith in Christ. In fact, he, in fact, he was rejected. But the Gentiles, of whom you and I come from, exercised that faith. And uh, in the portion of Scripture where there is a request to teach them how to pray, there is the prayer lesson that is given the Lord Jesus says nevertheless shall the son of man or son of God find faith when he returns and so there is a question of this day and hour in which we live even amongst Christian people about their faith and their prayers and we certainly lift our prayers up to the Lord we want our prayers to be heard but the Lord Jesus has us examine ourselves when he makes a statement of when he returns will it be faith and uh, we know that there's going to be a falling away first. There's a falling out, a falling away. And it is also a falling away of the faithful and the faithfulness of God's people. But he comments that this woman had practiced great faith. In particular, as I read this portion of scripture, uh, this verse 25 is where we gather our thought for this evening. And it is our request it is a request not only for our nation, it's a request for our church, it's a request for our families, and it's a request for our Christians. And, and uh, Christians are hurting, and I see that, and you see that, we participate in that. We know that there are those that are having difficulty, there are those that are having health issues, there are uh, many that are uh, not feeling well, but there are more that are, that are deeper than that. They need help. And so this individual, you know, she comes, and the Bible says, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, and there is our thought, uh, Lord, help me. That's the title. That's the thought this, this evening. Lord, help me. And so you can enter into that if you want, and I enter into that. And you can uh, think about this, and you can allow that, uh, that phrase, that thought, to resonate with you if you need it. If you don't, you will, but you may need it tonight. I need it tonight. Lord, help me. That's the title. And so when you look at this portion of Scripture, uh, i just give you like three thoughts around this, and we'll look at some Scripture. But uh, in this thought in the title, of Lord, help me. This individual, point number one, is uh, facing and is in what we would say an impossible situation. She, she's in an impossible situation. And so we would see this, that the woman has come to this, and it's no doubt before that she reached out to the Savior that she had dealt with this, I'm sure. And so in this thought of an impossible situation, it is, number one, seeing the need for help. And an, and an individual typically does not uh, reach out until they see that they have the need for help. The same thought is that a person uh, doesn't get saved until they get lost or they realize that they need to get saved. But I, I'm talking about uh, not just lost people, though she does represent a lost person, Gentile like we are, outside of you know the, the, the house of Israel, the house of God, and, and so forth, and coming with this need. But I'm saying that even for the child of God, 
and uh, to the point of seeing that they need help, that she's in an impossible situation. You know, when we step back from that thought for just a moment and kind of, kind of apply it globally as we look, there, there's some that condone uh, the activities and the practices that are taking place in America today. And uh, we understand that there was a, a signing, uh, again, of this um, uh, marriage act and so forth by the president, and there would be many that would applaud that. And there were many there that would applaud that. And they are waiting for that. They've been waiting for that. They condone those activities that are taking place. There, there's some that would uh, applaud the life and lifestyles that are taking place and honoring of those that uh, come out and, and do the things that they do. But uh, there are some that recognize we have a problem. And uh, America is in trouble. We realize that America is in trouble. And then there are some that are creating their own problems. There are some people, there are even some Christians that are creating their own problems. But there are some that are having great difficulty uh, just because of life. And I'm talking about just things that take place in life. It, it could be the, the, the Job story, a real account of an individual that uh, just demonstrates that there is trouble in life. And there are some that are like that. There, there, there are public situations and, and difficulties that are affecting everybody in this nation. You, you look at it biblically, and um, Daniel was taken into captivity not because of his own sins, but the sins of the nation. And the sins of the nation affected everybody in that, in that nation. So Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and those that were carried off, they were in captivity, not because of their own sins, but there are difficulties within this nation from the public realm that are affecting everybody. And it's biblically speaking to the fact that uh, God is against sin, and, and, and God is against the sins of the nation, and, and God can't bless in, in that respect. But I'm talking about also personal difficulties and situations. There are personal difficulties and situations that uh, some uh, get themselves in, they've gotten themselves in, and it, it's difficult, it, it's really difficult, to the point that they don't have control over them. There are uh, private situations and so forth. There's, you know, in, in this particular problem, uh, this situation, there was a family issue where the mother recognizes that the daughter's in trouble and uh, there's nothing that she can do about it. In fact, she was under a demonic influence. Now, the one under the demonic influence may or may not uh, realize that because the Bible says that uh, Satan has blinded the minds of those that uh, believe not and so forth. But I want to say in this impossible situation that you've seen uh, this lady in, there was a powerful enemy behind it. And so... Whether it's the public situation that we are dealing with in America, because most would say they, they can't believe the shape and the direction that it's going, and uh, the personal difficulties that are around, there's a powerful enemy that's behind it. And she tells us that from the Word of God, where the Bible says in verse 22, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. There's a powerful enemy uh, behind it, grievously vexed with the devil. And uh, I, I thought about that, and it, uh, this grievously vexed with the devil, it, it could be a tall, dark, and handsome devil. It, it, it could be any kind of a devil. It could be an addictive devil. It could be a spirit of rebellion. It could be spirit of divination. It, it can be... Uh, all, all kinds of spirits that the devil uses. He has lying spirits and, uh, and the art of deception. And uh, he, he has uh, devils that can appear good. He, he has demons that can appear like ministers of God. He can have uh, all kinds of devils and, and demons that can vex an individual. And this 
girl was vexed by a demonic spirit. This powerful enemy deals in sin and, and deprivation. Sometimes that sin is entered into by the individual, and yes, it can be entered into by the child of God getting into the flesh. We know that a born-again child of God has the Holy Spirit of God in them that does not sin, but they also live in a body of flesh that is able to sin, can sin, and perform all of the sins that a lost person does. And when an individual enters into that realm of sin and the depravity of sin, then the, the demon oppression in that case bids them, bades them to continue going uh, in that act of sin. The, the flesh is able to commit all of these sins, and it feeds on those sins. If an individual uh, uh, eats a piece of candy, you, you bet they want another piece of candy. If an individual takes a drink, they want another drink. If an individual takes uh, dope, they want more dope. If an individual is in an act of immorality, they want it more. And, and I, they can resist that only in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, but the flesh will give in to that. And uh, it's given over to this uh, sinful situation. It is either a demon possession for the lost person or it's a de demon oppression. And so this powerful enemy is sin and the depravity of the flesh. It, it's very powerful. The flesh is very powerful. And uh, we, as I've testified it, and we've noted this often as the, as the young people like to come and, and we like to pick them up on the, on the bus route. And the little children, they love church. Little children love church. And it, it seems like after they get to the age of accountability and their eyes are open to the things of the world, that uh, they love the world. Instead of the things of the spirit, they love the things of the world. And if they get a taste of the world, and then they, they get attracted to that and it just is spiraling down. This powerful enemy is, is Satan and his demons. She recognized that and said, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. This grievously vexed with the devil is the only answer, I believe, to some of the things that are going on around us. I believe that the closer that we get to the second coming of Christ, that this demonic activity will increase. And uh, things are getting more and more difficult. Uh, drugs and the use of drugs and the power of those drugs is more powerful than it ever has been. And uh, you would say, why would somebody uh, take a chance on uh, taking a, a fentanyl pill or a shot if they know that they would, would die, and they do die? I read where it's either 50 or 100 more times powerful than morphine, and yet you, you see it all the time. And, uh, you know, young people on drugs and drug addiction, uh, an individual uh, told me that, uh, and I, I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a talented individual with skills, so that uh, he uh, tried a, a certain drug, and this is only within the past several years, and said that it was so powerful he could not get off of it. From a, 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 a trial, just try it. Couldn't get away. And then certain things took place that forced him off of it and he is you know by the grace of god staying away from it but he says it haunts him and so that's what the young people are against that that's what's that's what's up uh, against us and i i don't mean to get uh, morbid but uh, on these shootings and these types of things that are taking place if you if you Read some of those interviews that they've made with them. These young people that are mass killing, they say, well, it was like a video game. And so it's in, in real life, real time for them. But I, I'm saying it, it's more than it used to be. And it's more difficult than it used to be. And it's in their forefront more than ever. 
and it's, it's a demonic activity. She was possessed with a demon, and her mother wanted to help her. It looks like an impossible situation. And so you can realize that, yeah, America is there, and, and the, the system is there, and so forth. And then, you know, you may think of something that seems impossible in, in your own life or family. Seems like an impossible situation. When you go on with this account, it not only is an impossible situation that she was facing, but it looks on the surface as an improbable solution. She went seeking help. It looks like an improbable solution as she went seeking help because when she went, the Bible says, and she cries, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. It, it doesn't look like in verse 23 that up front that the disciples care or can help to be sent away. And there are times when the brethren uh, cannot help. There, there are times when they will not help. There are times when they cannot help. And, and you and I as children of God, if we're not in the impossible situation, we, we need to uh, have some compassion on those that are in a situation. Sometimes that, you know, they can offer sympathy and empathy and, and, and prayer, but sometimes they just can't physically do, but they ought to be able to have some care for these other folks because you don't know when you would be in one of those. At, at first, it doesn't look like the Lord cares. In verse 24, he says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, that's a statement that is a fact as to the Jew first, and he lays this down to us. But when you think about it and you own it, those that are not firsthand connected with your pain or your, your issue, sometimes they can't uh, feel that until they enter into that situation or that to give a solution. There, there's sometimes, and I, I'm not going to be mean, but it's sometimes it seems like that. Uh, the brethren would say, well, the individual gives what they deserve. And we certainly don't want to take that kind of an attitude because uh, we don't want what we deserve. If we got what we deserved, it'd be hell. And praise God, we don't. If we could just get somebody to enter into this situation with us that can help us and to, to feel that, it seems like an improbable situation. And so we see in this account there is an impossible situation that she's in. She can't fix it. It seems up front that there's an improbable solution. But I want to say this last and this is the positive transition in the thought there is an immutable Savior. This is the source of help. He's the source of your help. And the Bible gives us this account and other accounts like this for you and I to realize that there are situations we have no control over. We may or may not have gotten ourselves into them. And it, it may seem like an improbable solution, but if you would allow your faith to stand, if you would allow your faith to go through the test like she was tested, the devil tempts you to uh, make you lose your faith. The, the Lord Jesus tests your faith to build your faith. That you would allow this to allow you and I to see that there is an immutable Savior. He is the source of our help. Now, notice this in Malachi chapter 3. Last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. 
In Malachi chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 6, Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And so within that verse, he says, I am the Lord, I am Jesus, I am God, uh, I change not. Uh, God doesn't change, he's the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. It's speaking about the immutability of God, that he does not change. And it's also speaking about part of his unchangeableness is that he is a merciful God. He says, I don't change, and because I don't change, uh, therefore your sons of Jacob are not consumed, or he's going to give them mercy. This is the last book of the Old Testament. And his children, the chosen of Israel, have not been faithful to him. You've read that throughout the Old Testament. And they have gone into captivity. They've gone out of captivity. The ten tribes are dispersed. You've walked with them through the wilderness. You've read the accounts of them. They're murmuring, they're griping, they're complaining. And with all of that, there's been chastisement, yes. But because God does not change, His mercy does not change. And He says, therefore, you're not consumed because if His mercy had been expired, they would have been consumed. God does not want to hurt His people. God wants to help His people. And God is merciful. God is long-suffering toward us. The Bible says that He's not willing that any would perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. He doesn't want you to uh, barely make it. He doesn't want you miserable. He doesn't want you suffering. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the immutable Savior. He is the source of my help. She had an impossible situation. Maybe you're facing something like that. Or you kind of look around kind of bleak like it's an impossible situation. You think it's an improbable solution from what I've asked and what I've seen and so forth. The answer is there is an immutable Savior. I change not. And so by the grace of God, He helped her. He will help me. He helps people. Throughout the Old Testament, in the New Testament, He helps people. God, God wants to help you. God wants to help this church. God wants to help you. God is the source of help. And I want that. And you want that, and you need that. I want that for you. I want that for your family. I want that for this church. I want it for America. I'm not going to give up on God. I'm not going to give up on the Word of God. I'm not going to give up on the Bible. I'm going to believe that God doesn't change. And God helps. And He wants to help. Notice just a couple of these. God helps. Look at Psalm 22. Psalm chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22 and in verse 19. This is a psalm of, of, of David, 22, 23, 24, and so on. This is Messianic, Psalm 22, talking about the Lord Jesus having his hands pierced and his feet. And he says in Psalm 22, and in verse 18, they part my garments among them, cast lots upon my vesture. This is messianic. It is prophetic of Christ on the cross. And this is God the Father allowing Christ to be on the cross. And it, it looks like that's an impossible situation. And there the disciples are standing there and there's Jesus being crucified. And, and there's his uh, dear mother there looking on. I mean, Jesus was only 33 and a half years old. You know, Simon had uh, told uh, Mary and Joseph that he came with this eight-year-old baby boy into the temple to have him dedicated. And, and uh, 
Simon had, had told them, or Simeon had told them that uh, the Holy Spirit of God had told him that you're not going to die until you see the salvation of God. And he picked up Jesus in his arms and held salvation. He said, I've seen salvation. And he told Mary that uh, her heart was going to be pierced. Her heart was pierced there, standing there at, at the cross, seeing Jesus with nails in his hands and his feet, suffering for the sins of the world. Seems impossible. In Psalm 22, he says this, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus and crying out to God the Father. And the Bible says, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Haste thee to help me. God will help you. Now watch this. In verse 22, this is a dialogue back and forth. Whereas the psalmist is saying, and he's speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, obviously not knowing that he's speaking prophetic truth, messianic psalm. And you know the relationship between the Lord Jesus and David, the throne of David. And he says in verse 22, of this help that he gets, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? I'm, I'm going to praise God at church. God help me. I, I'm going to praise thee in the midst of the congregation. Amongst the brethren. Uh, I, I'm not going to send them the, away. I'm going to point them to. And I, I'm going to come praising God into the house of God. Praising God into the church of the living God. And I'm going to allow them to understand God helped me and God will help you. And God can help you. Notice in Psalm chapter 40. In Psalm chapter 40. In Psalm chapter 40 and in verse 12. The Bible says, For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. That, that's, that's trouble, deep trouble, evils in his own sin. Uh, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together, but seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. This aha, aha would be like somebody saying, you get what you deserve. I already know what I deserve. I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. I, I want forgiveness. And so thereby, I might want to look at another individual and say, aha, aha, you get what you deserve. I'm not going to be the brethren that says, send them away. I'm going to be the brethren that says, bring them in. God help me. God can help you. And God will make haste to help you. And uh, he says, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O my God. And there is many, many, many. If you need help and you want help and you want to be encouraged, 
you just do a, a Bible study on the word health. And you, you go between those that are, are talking about uh, getting help from God or getting help from some outside source. The ones that get help from God get help. He's the source of help. There's so many. The immutable Savior knows. He made me. He made you. And He knows. The immutable Savior cares. Casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. Not only does He know and He cares, but He can. Notice this, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. This is the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus to His heavenly Father. In John chapter 17, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify Thy Son, that thy son also may glorify thee. This is before going to the cross. Now watch this. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. Jesus can. Power over all flesh. The, the biggest problem that you have is the flesh. The, the soul that is saved by the grace of God has the Holy Spirit of God indwelling and sealing to the day of redemption cannot sin, but the old flesh nature does sin. And the old flesh nature is prone to wonder and gives you all the trouble. And she came and said, uh, Have mercy on me, O Lord. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Your difficulty as a child of God is that of the flesh. The flesh is weak. The flesh begins to doubt. The flesh begins to lose faith. And it says here, Thou hast given him power over all flesh. Jesus is the source of help. And so we cry out, Lord Jesus, I'm having difficulty in the flesh. I believe, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. I am weak and weary. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'm weak in the flesh. I, I need help. Jesus helps. If you close in Matthew chapter 15 again, when you look at the lady that had the impossible situation, it looked like an improbable solution, but the immutable Savior reacted when she stayed with her faith, passed the faith test, cried out for mercy. In Matthew 15, 22, she says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. It goes back and forth. In verse 25, the Bible says, Then she, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She came and worshipped Jesus and said, Lord, help me. Jesus, help. Jesus can help you. Jesus can help you get over something. Jesus can help you get through something. If you lend it over to him, Jesus can help you from getting into something. And it's by his grace. This evening he will either remove the problem, fix the problem, or give you some more grace to handle the problem. Mm -hmm. And all of those are accounts within the word of God. He'll either remove it, He'll fix it. Or he'll give you added grace to handle it. It'll be through his grace. He giveth more grace. When do I get it? When I need it. Amen. Amen. Now here's two closing thoughts. And again, I, I don't know if you need this this evening. Do you, you 
and I, I'm sure you do. I'm sure we do collectively. I do, and I know you do. There's too many accounts in the Word of God where Jesus helps people to say he won't help me. He will help me. He helped her. Now here's the two closing thoughts. If I blame him, he cannot help me. If I blame him, he cannot help me. Reciprocal, if I bless him, he will help me. This woman, if she was a contemporary Christian, and I don't mean in a bad way, I'm talking about in this modern age of Christianity, if she was in the Christendom that we live in today, and she would have been spoken to like that at church, she would have left. It's a test of faith, is all it is. She passed. She got her prayer answered. How does she bless him, preacher? She said, O Lord, thou son of David, Recognizing who he is. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. With an outpouring of heart. She wasn't like a scribe or a Pharisee. That was trying to catch him. She had a need. And even when. The things that were said to her. Like the brethren saying. Send her away. Or the Lord Jesus talking about. It's not meat for me to give the bread to the dogs. The Bible says she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She blessed me. Lord, have mercy on me. She was blessed of Jesus because she was a blessing to Jesus. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, help me. Tonight, tonight you, you consider that. God, I've got a great need. Could be one of those impossible needs. I, I, I've tried. I, I can't do anything about it. I'm asking, dear Lord, that you would remove the problem, fix the problem, or give me grace to handle the problem, the situation. I'm asking that from a heart, Lord Jesus, and I'm going to praise you in the midst of the congregation. By the grace of God, let's do that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Dear Heavenly Father, you can search the hearts. And dear God, you can speak to our hearts and you can help us because you demonstrated it throughout scriptures. I don't know the specific needs, but we all stand in need. There are those that are hurting. There are those on the prayer request list that are in need. But there are those that are in the building this evening that are in need. We know globally that the nation is in need or churches are in need, but we stand in need, and I stand in need. And so I say, dear Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And then I say, Lord, help me. Please help this people, and please help this church. We ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. Amen.